Hey Ed, um, it's good to be here. I've had uh, pretty awesome three or four days and I've been listening to you and uh, I'd like some other people to hear you talk about anything you want to talk about, but if you could start from the top about how you got into your Indian ways to begin with, uh, that would be pretty awesome. Well, thanks Bill. and. Uh... Well, it, uh, for me, it started around 1989. Uh, you know, I was a police officer uh, in a community here, Tobik, First Nation. Um, we had a tragedy there. Uh, you know, a young father had uh, uh, committed suicide. He took his own life. And, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, kind of bothered the whole community. And uh, so anyway, I heard about the community going to be having uh, talking circle down at the community hall at the time and uh, I never heard about a talking circle and you know or about a smudge or anything like that and but anyway because of uh, the connection I had with the young man that uh, passed away uh, I decided that I should go to this uh, talking circle you know because it affected me too as well eh? and uh, so I went down to the community hall and when I got there there was people there you know they had chairs set up in a circle you know the family of the uh, the young man uh, that passed away was there and there was a couple elders there at the time and uh, you know they were explaining to us uh, what was going to happen you know they said that uh, they talked about the smudge and it was the first time I ever heard about a smudge and they said that they were going to smudge us cleanse our minds and our and our hearts and our bodies they said after that they were going to start a talking circle and they would pass the eagle feather around and you know and the only one that could speak at the time was the one holding the feather and everybody else would listen and then when it got my when it came to my turn i held the feather and i shared with how the young man's death affected me and you know, uh, it was very emotional. Um, but it was the first time that I've ever experienced in my life that, you know, when respect, you know, when somebody was talking, everybody else listened. And when it came your turn, then people listened to you. Never had that kind of experience before. So anyway, after the talking circle there, my buddy, uh, and I'm sure he'd be okay for me to mention his name. His name was Vincent. And he was a patient at the time at the Tobik Rehab. We have our own rehab center here in the community. And I was on duty that day, and uh, after that, he, I asked him if I'd give him a ride up to the rehab. He got in, and we drove up to the rehab. When we got there, he, uh, he asked me if I'd come in have a coffee or a tea and talk I said sure so him and I we went in and there was other clients there that never attended the talking circle but him and I went up and had a cup of coffee and you know we talked about that experience you know the talking circle and you know I told him you know that that was very powerful and emotional but at the same time I, I felt that it was good so after that you know we Vince was talking about a sweat lodge ceremony and I I've never attended a sweat lodge ceremony before in my life or I didn't know what it was and he said well Ed he said I could tell you so much about it he said rest is going to have to experience yourself he said so anyway he told me about it he said next week he said we're having a sweat lodge he said if you want to come and I told him uh, sure he said, just, well, bring shorts and towel and tobacco. He said, when you get there, they'll explain the rest to you. So, I, you know, what week went by, I was kind of excited and looking forward to the sweat lodge. But at the same time, because I was raised Catholic, you know, and my mom was a very traditional Catholic. She never knew anything about ceremony. And she used to discourage me from attending these types of ceremonies because she said it was bad. Only 
for the fact that she didn't know anything about it herself. So, so anyway, I thought, well, you know, I'm 24 years old and I know the difference between what's right, what's wrong, and if something's bad, then I'll go check it out, and chances are, if it's bad, I probably won't go back. So I, on the day of the ceremony, I went up, up to the woods there, and there was the elders there, and Vince was there, and I gave the back to the, to the elder, grandmother. And uh, she asked me, uh, why'd you come here today? And I told her, well, Vince, uh, asked me to come. I said, well, there must be a reason why you came. And I said, yeah. I said, well, she said, take this tobacco and go to the fire and offer this tobacco to your ancestors and ask them to help you in whatever it is that you want. And so that's when I started teaching, getting taught about the four, the seven directions. Eh? In each direction, there was, you know, a symbol of something in there. And we would start using the east direction, and we'd proceed to the south, to the west, to the north, up to Father Sky, down to Mother Earth, then south. And in each of these directions, we would acknowledge the symbol or the elements, you know, the four elements, the fire, the water, the air, and the earth. And we would acknowledge in the north of where we believe the medicine comes from, you know, the snow, the water is medicine. And we would always acknowledge the north for that medicine. And after that, we went in, a, in the sweat lodge and they brought the grandparents in and after that they closed the door and I, of course I explained, you know, a little bit about what was going to happen. Excuse me, Ed, what are the grandparents? Grandfathers and grandmothers. Yep, what do they look like or what are they made out of? Well, physically, you could refer to your own grandfather and grandmother. But in our ancestors and our spirits, our grandfathers and grandmothers, the rocks we also refer to as grandfathers and grandmothers, because they're the ones that was placed here before us, and they passed our knowledge, their wisdom down to us, the young people, the grand, their grandchildren. So they would bring these grandparents in the lodge and in the center there. And they close the door and all of a sudden they would pour water, this, med this medicine water onto these grandparents. And at that time for me, I just had this overwhelming feeling that I never experienced in my life. It was a good feeling like, I'm like, wow, you know. And after that, I wanted to know more. I know more about this, these ceremonies. So after that, I was having some difficult times. And I met this elder, Joe Vincent, my brother, Irvin Poltz, and he lived down in Wichita. And we visited with him the first time, and the first time I met him, and he, he said to us when we, before we left, he said, anytime you want to come on back, come on back and visit me. So anyway, we left there, and one particular time I was having a difficult time and so I remember Urban there he said come on back and we'll, you know visit so that particular day I went down there I drove down and went in and I told him I said Herb gave him tobacco tobacco is very important he didn't give to an elders and uh, I asked him for help I said can you help me and he said, I'm not going to feel sorry for you. And I said, I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I want you to help me. So anyway, after that, uh, I told him about whatever, what difficulty I was going through at the time. Eh? And after I was done, he suggested to me, he said, Ed, 
said, I want you to go back home. He said, I want you to go up to the mountain. He said, I want you to go look for your brother, the birch tree, and ask him for helping. Of course, in my mind, not thinking out loudly, but so man, this man is crazy. He wants me to become a tree hugger. But at the same time, I'm thinking, well, I did come to him and ask him for help. And whatever he was suggesting to me to do, that it was going to help me. So I didn't question it, at least out loud anyway. So after I left there, I came home and I grabbed some tobacco and I drove up to the mountain. And I parked my truck at the bottom of the hill. And I started walking up the mountain. Along my way, I passed a lot of birch trees, both on the left side and the right side. And I continued walking, and finally I got about three quarters way up the mountain, eh, and I wanted to have a cigarette, I wanted to smoke, so I stopped, and took out a cigarette and lit it, and all of a sudden I looked to my left, and there was a birch tree, a pretty good sized one, and in my mind I'm thinking like, that must be the one. So after I had my cigarette, I went over. And I put my arms around the birch tree. And I started crying. After I was done, I gave thanks to the tree with tobacco. And I left, came home. And I waited for a few days and went back down to Irvin's. And I gave him tobacco. And he said, well, how'd you make out? And I told him, I said, well, Irv, the day you were telling me to do this, I said, in my mind, I was thinking that you're half crazy. You want me to become a tree hugger. <laughs> and he just kind of chuckled. He said, no. He said, well, what happened? And then I told him. I said, I went on, I got up there. I said, I said, I went to hug that tree and I started crying. said, what, so what did your brother tell you? I said, well, he told me that in order for me to survive in my environment and in my elements, I have to be flexible. And he said, well, he said, this thing, he said, this tree, he said, that tree had his own difficulties in his lifetime. It's like you, you're having difficulties, different kind, but there's still difficulties. He says, from one to time, that tree was a seed underneath the ground. He said he already had difficulties battling with whatever is underneath there, insects, frost, whatever. So one day that seed came up to the ground, sprouted out. Just think, Throughout that tree's lifetime, all the difficulties it went through. Then he, after that, he said, Stand up. I stood up. He said, Put your hands to your side. So I did. He said, Now I look at your feet. He said, He said, Your feet are like the roots on that tree. He said, put out your arms. So I put out my arms. He said, now your arms are like the branches of that tree. He said, the top of the tree is like the top of your head. He said, where's the, where's the heart of the tree? I said, it's in the center. He said, where's your heart? I said, it's in the center. You know, I never realized something that simple could mean so much. 
so then later on after that I it's like I want to learn more about who I was and where I came from again go visit an urban I always take tobacco and give to the elders eh? So I told him, I said, uh, I want to know who I am and where I came from. He said, you really, you really, you really want to know who you are? And where you came from? You. There was a window in his living room where I was sitting, and in the background there was a forest. And he said, If you really want to know who you are and where you came from, he said, Your family is waiting to teach you. So you're not going to go today. You say some preparation you have to go through before you go and do that. Finally, day came when I went on my first fast. But before that, too, he told me to come to talk to my wife about it, so she support me, eh? You know, I'm going to I'm going to be the one that makes the decision, but at least to let her know what I'm going to do and why. And she did. She supported me. So I went went in my first fast. And I stayed there for four, roughly four nights and five days, with no food and no water. Only ones that came to visit me was the elders. I even struggled with that the first day. Day went up, I was kind of drizzling out. And went in there and I went into my hut, made a hut to sleep in, shelter. I was in there that day and a lot of thoughts different thoughts and feelings going through my head, even me questioning about what am I doing here? Now I was starting to get a little thirsty and hunger wasn't so bad, but being up in the wood by myself, not being used to that, always around people. So I was starting to question about, again, why am I here? Why don't I just go down home? Why don't I just walk back home? Get a drink of water and I'll be around my family. And so I struggled with that. Finally, I don't know what time it was. You lose track of time when you're in there. I hear somebody coming. Eh? He said, Ed. I heard a voice say, Ed. And it was Frank. Frank DeConte. He asked me, can I come in? Yeah, come on in, Frank. He came into my hut and he asked me how I was doing. I said, I'm not doing very well, Frank. And I didn't have my fire going. He said, you want me to start your fire? We'll smoke a pipe after. I said, sure, Frank. I appreciate that. So he went out and started my fire and after he started his fire, he came back in and we smoked a pipe. That's the first time I was exposed to, you know, it wasn't the first time being in the woods, but just first time being in the woods under them circumstances. Anyway, after Frank lit the fire and we smoked a pipe, I felt a little better. Frank started telling me about, you know, why I get hungry or thirsty, he said, 
You take your sweet grass, he said. You light it. Not smoke, he said. Pass that sweet grass to help you with your thirst or your hunger. He said, and if during the night, if you hear something around, he said, take your rattle and shake it. I said, and I'll be back tomorrow. Eh? So he left, and by then it was dark. Eh? He said, before you go to bed, he said, you could go to the fire and offer some tobacco. I was that our responsibility too was my responsibility too was to keep that fire going as long as I was there. So again, the uh, you know, you lose all track of time. You don't know what time of day it is. All you know is dark or all you know is day. Again, you know it wasn't so much the hunger but the thirst. I know sometimes during the night I woke up being thirsty. So I lit my sweet grass and smudge and read that in and ask the mother to help me. Fell back to sleep again. I don't know what time of the night it was. All of a sudden I hear something out in the woods. I woke up and I remember what Frank said. Take your rattle and shake it. So I grabbed my rattle and I shook it. And after that I went back to bed. Next thing you know it was daylight. I went through my first night of fasting. And during the day I had, you know, they gave me some stuff to do that I needed to do in there while I was there. And that evening, Frank came back again, and smoked another pipe and asked how I was doing. And I told him. <coughs> By then, he said, I'll be back tomorrow. Okay. So, the first night after Frank, before he left, he gave me some instructions of if I became thirsty or if I became scared if something came. He told me to use my sweet grass and my rattle. So, sometimes during the night, I become thirsty. I lit my sweet grass and, and I used the smoke as, a, as water. And uh, sometimes during the night again, I didn't know you lose track of time, so he couldn't tell what time of the night it was. All of a sudden, I was woken up by a noise. So I remember what Frank told me: is, "Take your rattle and shake it. Whatever's out there will leave." And so I did that, and by then, you know, it's day. You know, I don't know what time of the day it is, but it's day. You see the daylight. So you start your day by. You know, morning with prayer, again acknowledgement, see, thanking for life, thanking for everything. So during the four days, you know, I had visitors come up, and you know, one thing though, after around the third day, uh, I didn't have no more thirst, I didn't have no more hunger, and I was very comfortable being out there with my family. I guess I started adjusting to not realizing before, but all the comforts that I needed existed right there. You know, my family was there. And so by the fourth day, you know, uh, when I got out of the lodge, you know, they out of fasting, they took me into the sweat lodge ceremony. And they kind of, I guess, would be <laughs> in the English term today, would be debrief me to debrief me and cleanse me before I came home to the feast you know and I met my family and after four days eh, it was very uh, emotional but overwhelming so that's where I started out on my journey on the red road taught me a lot about Four days when I was there taught me a lot, eh? Something that I thought I couldn't do. Taught me about respect and about acknowledging. You know, acknowledging the elements, the fire, the water, the air, and the earth. Acknowledging 
our grandparents, our grandfathers and our grandmothers and our parents, our fathers and our mothers. The ego, the mother, and the creator. Over the years I realized that the songs and the stories were always about acknowledgments to our grandparents and to our ancestors and to everything that exists within this mother earth that has life and so I'm kind of lost right now um, I just said that you know I have a real deep appreciation and, and priceless thoughts and memories of you know the reason why our grandparents or our parents or our ancestors left us these stories in these songs was because of the of the love that they have for who they are and who we are still today you know the love you know for everything that exists and, and when we say all our relations in our language we say and that it's not just referring to the human you know it's everything that exists within this mother earth that has life that's all our relations well Ewan Thank you very much.